Good day, and here we are, another week gone by, and uh, continue, continuing on uh, with uh, Psalm 119, uh, The Path to Life. If you've been tracking with the series, I hope you've had a chance to go through it, uh, Psalm 119, for yourself in the scriptures, and spend some time in there, and it's been quite a uh, a blessing for myself as I've taken the time to do that myself as well. So we want to begin today and uh, I think many of you would might uh, know who I'm talking about when I say Joni Erickson Tada. So Joni was born in 1949. She was the youngest of four, four daughters and Joni's early years were active as many young peoples are. She enjoyed things like hiking and riding horses and swimming just to mention a few activities. Then it was July 3rd, on, then it was on July 30th, 1967, at the age of 70, 17, that Joni dove into Chesapeake Bay. And after misjudging the shallowness of the water, she had a fracture between the fourth and fifth cerv cervical vertebrae and became a quad quadriplegic, uh, paralyzed from the shoulders down. And during her rehab, uh, Joni experienced, as many do in this kind of situation, all sorts of emotions like anger, she was depressed, she had suicidal thoughts, and even doubted her faith in God. And if you would consider it on the positive side, during her therapy, Joni learned to paint with a brush between her teeth, and she would also write uh, books with, in this manner, and also along with the help of uh, voice recognition software. So along with her paintings, Joni has written, as far as I understand, over 40 books to date, she recorded several music albums and even starred in her own, in an autobiographical uh, movie of her life. In 1979, Joni founded uh, Joni and Friends. You can find that online. Just Google Joni and Friends, and I would recommend you do that. And the goal uh, for Joni was to, quote, accelerate Christian ministry in the disability community throughout the world. Joni said this of her diving accident. Quote, what exactly was God thinking when he wrote a divine accident into the script of my life? To be sure, he knew it would transform me and give me a greater love for Jesus. But God saw beyond that. He was seeing millions of others with disabilities. It was, my, it was why God designed Joni and Friends. My broken neck was the beginning of God's greatest use of my life. It launched his astounding plan to reach thousands of people with disabilities with his love, end quote. So from Joni's story to uh, the New Testament, uh, written a long time ago, and particularly the book of Acts, and in there we find the events provided for us in great detail, really, if you look at it, in the life and times of the Apostle Paul, who would eventually end up writing 13 of the letters that we have in our New Testament. And Acts reveals the story of a man whose name was Paul, who endured and fa faced his fair share of physical, emotional, and spiritual suffering. This apostle of the Gentiles also experienced his fair share of persecution for his preaching of the gospel. We see that in some of the accounts where he talks about 40 lashes less one. He was beaten with rods. He was stoned. He was in prison many times. He was hungry and thirsty, had sleepless nights, and so much more. You can find it all there in the book of Acts and even in his letters. So thinking of Joni and thinking about the Apostle Paul, uh, this begs some questions. First one, how are we to understand suffering in our lives? And then how should we respond to suffering as Christians? And how have we responded to suffering as Christian? How should we respond and how have we responded to suffering as Christians? Going back to the Apostle Paul, to his second letter to the church at Corinth, uh, he said this, uh, beginning in verse 3, he said, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, chapter 1, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our affliction, so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the same, with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. So please now turn in your Bibles to Psalm 119. 
We'll be beginning today at verse 49 down to uh, verse 56. Psalm 49, verse, uh, Psalm 119, verse 49. I'm uh, sorry about that, folks. Remember your word to your servant in which you have made me hope. This is my comfort in my affliction that your promise gives me life. The insolent utterly deride me, but I do not turn away from your law. And when I think of your rules from of old, I take comfort, O Lord. Hot indignation seizes me because of the wicked who forsake your law. Your statutes have been my songs in the house of my sojourning. I remember your name in the night, O Lord, and keep your law. This blessing has fallen to me that I have kept your precepts. The Lord bless the reading of his word. Let us pray together. O Lord God, we thank you. As we turn now our attention to the scriptures, we ask, O Holy Spirit, that you would give us um, illumination and understanding that would produce action in our lives and glory to you. In Jesus' name, amen. So as we look at this stanza, these eight verses here, and consider the psalmist, the author of our text, we ask the question, what can we learn about him from the context? What can we learn? So to begin with, it's important that we understand that the psalmist considers himself a servant of God. A servant of God. We see this in verse 49 where the psalmist said, Remember your word to your servant. See, whatever, the, whatever else the psalmist was, or might have been, whatever else he may have been experiencing, we can know that the psalmist was a servant of God. We also find in the context that this was not only an intellectual understanding or an intellectual knowing of God. That was part of it. It was not only the knowledge of God that he had discovered from the Word of God, but it was an abiding relationship with the living God. You see, the psalmist worshipped God with his whole being. And the psalmist would have been familiar with the Torah, the first five books of the, of the Bible that we have today. He would have been familiar with Deuteronomy, what uh, Moses uh, has said there. And Moses said in Deuteronomy, chapter 6, verse 4, You shall love uh, the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. The psalmist worshipped God with his whole being. The psalmist was a servant of God. He worshipped God with his whole being. And we also find here in the stanza that yeah, he was no different in, with, than you and me in, in many respects. As you or I can find ourselves in difficult circumstances, we find the psalmist in our text was under some kind of affliction, some kind of trial, some kind of trouble. For he said here in verse 50, this is my comfort in my affliction. His relationship with God was engaged, my friends, in the reality of everyday life. The good, the bad, the ugly of everyday life. It was his affliction, it was his comfort that we encounter here, get a glimpse of in this context. The psalmist was a servant of God, and the psalmist was suffering from trials and tribulations in his context. And also the psalmist had placed his hope in God and discovered comfort in the midst of affliction in the word of God. We see this in verse 50, second half. He said, your promise gives me life. We remember how he had described his circumstances earlier in the psalm, where he said at verse 25, my soul clings to the dust. My soul clings to the dust. This is reminiscent of Joel, reminiscent of Joel who after having everything taken from him, his children, his livelihood, even eventually his health, it tells us in Job chapter 1, verse 20, that he fell on the ground. It was it for him. He just fell on the ground. So falling on the ground, like Job, or a soul clinging to the dust, like the psalmist, points to a place of despair and sadness and mourning and suffering and trials and even hopelessness. See, the psalmist was in a hard place. And yet he turned to the word of God, which he describes as giving him life. Another way we could put it is that the word of God revived the psalmist in his affliction. The NIV translates verse 50, second half, this way. Your promise preserves my life. My friends, the word of God had caused the psalmist to have hope. Verse 49, in the midst of his affliction. 
Now, Joni Erickson Tata recounts the story of April and her family. April and her family were excited and looking forward to a week of camping together, that family time together. And on their journey, on their way, the family was involved in a car accident, which resulted in April breaking her neck upon impact. As it was for Joni, after diving in the shallow water, April ended up as a, quad, up as a quadriplegic. And if this wasn't enough, suffering for April, within two years her husband had left her, which also resulted in a custody battle for the children. Friends, what a tragedy. What a heartbreak. Most of us cannot even relate to this thing, this kind of pain. We have no idea of the amount of sorrow and tears that must have flowed from April. So the question is, how are we to understand suffering like this? According to Joni and her ministry, over a billion people in the world have some sort of disability or disabilities. Think about that, a billion people. How have you handled suffering in your life when you think of all that? As we consider these questions, we need to really be careful to not compare, not to compare suffering. Because friends, suffering and trials and tribulation come into our lives in all shapes and kinds and ways. And it doesn't help anyone to compare. Pastor David Ziegler from Minnesota learned early in his pastorate that everyone suffers somehow. Maybe chronic pain, maybe a broken relationship, maybe cancer, and yes, even disabilities like Joni and April through an accident. Pastor David Zugler understands all too well about pain as his wife struggles with chronic pain daily. How should we respond to suffering as Christians? How have we responded to suffering? Back to the text, verse 51, first half. The insolent utterly deride me. The NIV translates it this way. The arrogant mock me unmercifully. The psalmist who loved and trusted God's word and trusted God and worshipped him was mocked by those who wanted nothing to do with God and his word. This reminds us again of Job and his friends who, who thought that their good intentions would help Job understand why he was suffering. But let's let Job speak for himself on how much he was suffering. Job said, my spirit is broken. My days are extinct. The graveyard is ready for me. Job 17.1 Job wondering where he could find hope beyond the moment. Did his friends help? Again, we turn to Job and what he said, Surely there are mockers about me, and my eyes dwell on their provocation. Job 17, 2. Can I ask you, have you ever been mocked for your trust and faith in Jesus Christ? I don't know where you live as you're watching this video, but have you ever been mocked? Have you ever suffered for your trust and faith in Christ? And if you have, how have you dealt with it? In our fallen and broken world, suffering is comprehensive in nature. Sooner or later, everyone suffers and struggles in life. Suffering, as I mentioned earlier, is not found in one kind of form only. Joni and April suffered greatly because of their broken necks. Some suffer greatly from broken relationships, some from abusive relationships. And for all the good attentions that we have in the world, human slavery remains, racism abounds, and so much more. Paste, pastor, paster, <laughs> pastor Dave Zugler was right. Everyone suffers somehow. While the psalmist was afflicted as others mocked him, persecuted him for his faith and trust in God and in the word of God, did you know that in a world today, over 300 million Christians face severe persecution, and I mean severe, for their faith and trust in God and his word? So here we are back, landing on those same questions. As Christians, how should we respond to suffering? How have we handled suffering in our lives? Well, let's go back to our text and ask this question. Where did the psalmist find comfort as he was being mocked for his faith in God? Where did he find hope? Well, let's look at verse 50. This is my comfort in my affliction that your promise gives me life. 
Verse 52, when I think of your just decrees from of old, I take comfort, O Lord. Where did, this, where, did this, where did the psalmist find comfort? Listen to what the King David said about comfort from God. But the steadfast love of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting to those who fear him, and his righteousness to children's children, to those who keep his covenant and remember to do his commands. Psalm 103, verse 17 and 18. Where did he find his comfort? In the tender mercies of God. Did he run from the mocking? Did he hide from the barbs and condemnation of others? But tell, I don't know, but what did he do? He remembered. We see this. He remembered your word, verse 49. He remembered your promise, verse 50. He remembered your just decrees. Whose word? Whose promise? Whose just decrees? Who was the psalmist holding on to when his soul was in the dust? We take a little trip now from the psalmist, time of the psalmist, to Matthew's gospel. And in Matthew's gospel, uh, at the very close of the gospel, we find there Jesus commissioning his apostles with the authority given to him by the Father to go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. Matthew 28, verse 18 and 19. And then Jesus said something. Even though the psalmist had yet to know the Messiah as these uh, disciples did, the psalmist depended on this and believed it when Jesus said, and behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Who was the psalmist holding on to in his trials? Well, God. So when you are struggling, and you will if you aren't now, and suffering, and you will if you aren't now, when it's in the darkest days of your life, Dear follower of Jesus Christ, dear brother and sister, you might not feel it or see it. You might not understand it. You cannot see past or through your pain. The word of God reminds us that Jesus is right there. The one who suffered for the sin of the world is there with you, mourning with you, helping you, comforting you, caring for you, and yes, even holding you. For Jesus will keep his promise. I am with you always to the end of the age. And you can take that to heart, my dear friends. Well, moving on, we look at verse 53 to 56. It gives us a glimpse of the psalmist's response to his persecutors. We read in verse 53, the psalmist saying this, hot indignation seizes me because of the wicked who forsake your law. The affliction and the adversary we observe in this context would only strengthen the hope that the psalmist had in the promises of God as he trusted in the word of God. If the intent of the mocking of God's word was to demolish the psalmist's faith in God, it failed miserably. It did quite the opposite. It produced a righteous anger. The Common English Bible translates verse 53 this way, but I'm seized with anger because of the wicked, wicked. but I'm seized with the anger because of the wicked. As one commentary put it, quote, they drive him to greater loyalty. These persecutors drive the psalmist to greater loyalty. Verse 51, but I do not turn away from your law. You might be thinking, maybe you're not, but let's ask this question. Is anger the best response? My answer to your question is another question. Are you imposing your 21st century cultural assumption on the text. For the psalmist's response is not one of revenge. The psalmist's response should be seen as God-centered, a response of one who had placed their hope in the living God. In the reality, it was a response from a heart of humility and humble, humbleness, pardon me. Yes, the psalmist's life was difficult, Yes, God's word helped the suffering psalmist sing his song, verse 54, even in the place of affliction, as he remembered the name of the Lord. I remember your name in the night, O Lord. You see, the psalmist's righteous anger was not misplaced. It was a proper response to those who mock God and his word. You see, the mocking comes from a place of, 
of pride, selfish pride, not humility before a holy and just God. For the word of God had brought forth joy and confidence in the psalmist in the midst of his suffering. And when you think about this, friends, in this individualistic experience seeking 21st uh, century Western church that often neglects the word of God, you see here the psalmist was blessed because of the word of God. Verse 56, the word of God was a source of comfort and strength to him. The word of God was a source of the psalmist's faith in God. As the Apostle Paul reminds us, the faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ, through the word of God. Romans 10, 17. Quickly, we can have two takeaways from this for you and me. First, the psalmist was holding on to God in his trials and tribulations. He was holding on to God by faith, believing in the promise of God. Second, the psalmist was being held. He was being held in his trials and tribulations. So who was holding on to the psalmist? Of course, it was God. We go to Deuteronomy. Moses was coming to the end of his life. And he said to Israel as they were preparing to cross the Jordan into the promised land under the leadership of Joshua, he said to them, Be strong and courageous. Do not fear, for it is the Lord your God who goes with you. He will not leave you or forsake you. Deuteronomy chapter 31, verse 6. So we're back to questions. As Christians, how should we respond to suffering? How have we handled suffering in our lives? Yes, of course, we hold on to God as <clears throat> we are being held by God. But truth be told, my friends, isn't it easier said than done? For example, what do we do with the Apostle Paul's exhortation to the Romans when he said, and we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose, Romans 8, 28. How often that is taken out of its context, my friends, and used in the wrong way. But how are we to answer that? How are we to handle that exhortation? How can suffering work for good? Well, back to the Apostle Paul's exhortation that we had at the very beginning of this message. The New Testament, my friend, records for us real events with real people, with real struggles for very many different reasons, just like the Apostle Paul. And the Apostle Paul said, Blessed be the God, of Father and Father of our Lord Jesus, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort who comforts us in our afflictions. Paul, in his trials, held on to God as God held on to him. And then in the very same breath, Paul said two wonderful words, two amazing words, two words that might even revolutionize your understanding of suffering. He said, so that, so that we may be able to comfort those who are in affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. For as we share abundantly in Christ's sufferings, so through Christ we share abundantly in comfort too. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 4 and 5. That's a revolutionary understanding of the place of suffering in our lives, friends. Pastor Dave Zugler uh, said this, quote, God stands wholeheartedly with us in suffering so that we will stand wholeheartedly with others who are suffering. Here's the answer to that question then, isn't it? How should Christians respond to suffering? So how does our suffering help us to better comfort others? Well, Joni provides us with the way forward. We comfort others with our prayers, through his word, the Bible, and with the bigger picture. So by prayer and the word of God and reminding ourselves when we are suffering and even in the good times and reminding those that we comfort with or we join in their suffering or walk alongside with them that one day God will Wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. Revelation 21, verse 4. Well, what about the meantime, or in between time? Let's do what Joni did. When Joni said, when I met April, she was slumped in her wheelchair, a quadriplegic. So I parked my wheelchair next to her and I cried too. 
My tears flowed from the bowels of a fellow sufferer. I knew firsthand the horrors April was facing, and I silently pleaded, Oh God, how will this young mother ever make it? How can I comfort her? Lord, bless the reading of your word today and bless this time together. We thank you, Lord, that even though we don't understand it most of the time, we are comforted by those who suffer alongside of us. We even healed that way. Many of us can attest to that. Many of us can remember those times when in our trials and tribulations, someone would come and join us and the road would be just a little bit easier and a little bit smoother and healing would come so sooner than later. So Lord, help us to remember these things and help us to remember that it's not me, myself, and I. It's we are in this together. God, thank you, and I pray for those who are listening and watching this. God, bless them. Heal them according to your purpose and will, Lord. If they need healing, if they need salvation, pray, God, that you would grant them repentance. All this I pray for the glory of your name. Amen. Thanks for having me. God bless. Shalom.